Galveston, Texas. It's here in this town on the edge of the Gulf of Mexico that the Stella Solaris, the solar star, waits to sail. An appropriate name for a cruise marked, in a sense, by the stars. While less than 70 kilometers away at Houston is the NASA Space Center, a veritable headquarters since Apollo 13 of the American Space Conquest. The passengers of the Stella Solaris are embarking on a voyage which will lead them day after day to the discovery of a civilization in which astronomy played an essential role. The Stella Solaris slowly leaves Galveston and commences its long two-day crossing of the Gulf of Mexico towards the Mexican peninsula of Yucatan. Covering an area of over 1,000 kilometers long and 600 kilometers wide, the former Maya world takes in present-day southern Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, and part of Honduras and El Salvador. Since the dawn of our era, right up until the 15th century, magnificent, powerful, and mysterious cities of Tulum, Chichen Itza, Copan, and Tikal represented the splendor of the Maya world. Yes, please. Uh, can I help you? Zingo. Okay. But if you have the telephone, just pick up. Okay. During the two days at sea since leaving Galveston, the passengers have had time to familiarize themselves with their boat. As the Mexican coast comes into sight, some of them are eager to obtain last-minute information. Others more studious carefully read through the information brochures provided by the onboard lecturers. The Stella Solaris sails within view of Cozumel Island. Occupied by the Maya for 2,000 years, Cozumel was then almost completely abandoned. It wasn't until the Second World War, when Captain Cousteau explored the Palancar Reef, that the island was rediscovered and revealed to the world. Since then, Cozumel has become one of Mexico's most popular tourist resorts and one of the most favored stopover points for cruise ships coming from Florida. We normally receive about 20 boats a week. The tourists who come here are mainly Italian, French, German, and Americans. Lots of Americans. Really? Lots of Americans? Yes, they come from Miami, Florida. It takes an hour to sail from Playa del Carmen to Cozumel with this boat. Despite the beauty of the sea, which becomes an almost transparent turquoise color close to the shore, it must be remembered that the weather in this part of the Caribbean is very unpredictable, and the sea can be dangerous. It's thus that one of the creators of the world in Maya mythology was named Huracan, the origin of our present-day word hurricane. Thank you. 
We arrive at Playa del Carmen, a small market town and tourist resort, famous for its beaches, and which is the departure point for the Maya site of Tulum. We are in Tulum, and this city is located in front of the Caribbean Sea. The Mayans make this city with the protection of the wall and the protection of the reef on this side. The name of the reef is Palancar. It's the longest reef in America, comes from San Pedro Sula in Central America and goes to Isla Mujeres in front of Cancun. Founded in the year 1200, Tulum reached its peak two centuries later, around 1400. At that time, it was a trading port on the main sea route on the east coast of Yucatan. Overlooking the Caribbean Sea, certain buildings like El Castillo served as lookout posts or landmarks for sailors. In 1518, the conquistador Juan de Grijalva was cruising off the coast of Tulum. Impressed by the magnificent temples covered with fresco paintings and guarded by feather arrayed warriors, he likened the Tulum to Seville. The harshness and long duration of the crossing would explain such exaggerated enthusiasm, because Tulum is in fact a modest city with small sized buildings. In order to disguise the mediocre quality of the structures, the temple walls were decorated with large fresco paintings with cosmic motifs or with stucco sculptures representing the divine god who descends from heaven to receive the offerings of the humans and who symbolizes, for certain people, the extraterrestrial origin of the Maya. The main monument we have here is the temple of frescoes. On that temple, we have at the corners the representation of the life and death, or the duality, be alive or be dead. The one on the south side is light and the eyes are open. The one on the north side is dark with closed eyes. A rudimentary hut with a roof made of palm trees, built on a cultivated patch of forest, this is the traditional dwelling of the Yucatan lowland population. The descendants of the Maya number approximately six million. After suffering the Spanish conquest and the culture shock of colonization, the descendants of the Maya are today still considered second-class citizens, Indios. As a way of remaining faithful to the memory of their glorious ancestors, they continue to speak the Mayan language. Ah, you want to speak Maya? I don't speak Maya. But can you tell me if you feel Mayan or mm, Mexican? Only Mayan. You're proud of being Mayan? I speak a little Spanish, but otherwise only Maya. What are those? Yes. Beans. Beans. A distinctive feature of the Yucatan bedroom is the hammock, formerly made from woven agave fibers, now replaced by cotton. Did you buy this hammock or did you make it yourself? Ah, you bought it. The Yucatan Peninsula is an immense limestone-covered plain. In certain parts where the layer has subsided, the subterranean water rises to the surface forming natural wells or sinkholes, the chenotes. The chenotes were held sacred by the Maya, who used them as places for offerings, including human sacrifice, as in the sacred chenote at Chichen Itza. 
Today, these wells, which can be counted in hundreds all over Yucatan, constitute small sources of income for their owners. For a few pesos, you can swim in them or even dive in some of the deeper ones that provide access to the subterranean water channels. Penetrating further inland, we arrive at Valladolid, Yucatan's second largest city after Merida. During the later half of the 19th century, Yucatan was shaken by a violent conflict opposing the Maya and the white population, the caste war. Heavily taxed by the government, dispossessed of their land to benefit the large plantations, the Maya, with the help of weapons provided by the English colonists of Belize, managed to recuperate up to 90% of their ancestral land, which they retained against the onslaught of Mexico until the end of the 19th century, when they fell definitively under white rule. Far from the bloody episodes of the caste war of which it was the scene, Valladolid is now a peaceful and friendly city. Pearl barley, it's for children who are dehydrated. And the sapodilla cordials are for the stomach problems. Oh, for stomach problems? Yes, it's good for the stomach. And what about the others? The tamarind cordial is just for refreshment. Last stopover point on our Mexican journey, Chichen Itza, no doubt the most famous of the Maya sites. It's the 21st of March, date of the spring equinox. The visitors are crowding to admire Kulkulkan, the plumed serpent who gave its name to the pyramid and is brought to life on this precise date by the rays of the setting sun which undulate up the northern stairway of the pyramid. Unfortunately, the cloudy sky thwarts the apparition of the deity and the visitors, some having come from the other side of the world to witness the phenomenon, wait disappointedly. The Maya world continues to preserve its mystery. What secret hides within the pyramid of Kukulkan? Out of all of the buildings here, which is the one that impresses you the most and that you prefer above all the others? That one, El Castillo, because uh, that's where the serpent appears and uh, because it's the biggest. And there are the steps, 365 steps, representing the days in the year. El Castillo is a veritable calendar in stone of perfect, harmonious dimensions. Its 364 steps, plus one to accede to the temple, represent effectively the number of days in the solar year. But the Maya used other units of time, such as the Tun, which designates a duration of 20 times 360 days, and the Katun, equivalent to 20 tunes, and approximately 400 of our years. The advent of a Katun was celebrated by the construction of new edifices, such as the pyramid with four stairways at Chichen Itza. Why are you waiting here? Why am I? Yes, waiting here. Because it interests me very much. Because this place dates back thousands of years. I want to know all about it. It's very beautiful. And I want to know why the Maya built it. Facing El Castillo, the temple of the warriors and that of a thousand columns bear witness to the influence on the Maya of Yucatan of the Toltecs, a tribe who came from North Mexico in the 12th century. The columns, composed of square drums, are decorated with carved relief figures representing Toltec warriors or deities.
Although brilliant scientists, astronomers, and mathematicians, the Maya of the first millennium were nonetheless a bloodthirsty race, as demonstrated by the Tsompantli, a sort of stone fence covered with a large frieze representing impaled human skulls. Chichen Itza was abandoned in circumstances that remain obscure. However, during the colonial period that followed, the Maya cult continued to be practiced in secret on the remains of the ancient city. On board the Stella Solaris, while in the main lounge, the mariachis provide lively entertainment for the relaxing passengers. Scott Carpenter, one of the first American astronauts, tells us of his admiration for the ancient Maya. There is a similarity between what the ancient Maya did and what we are doing today in our explorations. They have this fascination for the skies, as we do, uh, and their sculptures revealed a beautiful thing that they did, and that was the gaining of an understanding of how the heavens worked. That's a beautiful thing. It is they, through their study, arrived at new truths and that's a very satisfying thing that's exactly what we're doing with our exploration of the sea and with our exploration of space we are learning new truths it is another thing we share with the ancient Maya Carlos and Charlie's the meeting place for all crew members of boats that anchor at Cozumel. And the crew of the Stella Solaris is no exception. Late in the night, after the crew has come back on board, the fire prevention officer performs his enigmatic ritual in the ship's passageways. At break of dawn, on the bridge, Captain Panorios and his second-in-command study the approach towards Belize City.
Belize City is protected by a section of the coral reef glimpsed in Yucatan, offshore of Tulum. Second in the world after that of Australia, it attains its full dimension here. As a makeshift hairdresser opens for business, the Stella Solaris drops anchor. The wash caused by this maneuver reveals the shallowness of the water here. Exceptionally, the passengers are taken ashore in high-powered boats from Belize City, which are habitually used for the link up with Lekai, the group of islands sheltered by the reef. When you measure the distance separating the Stella Solaris from the shore, you can appreciate the utility of these extremely powerful boats. Belize City lost its status as capital in the early 1960s when it was ravaged by a violent hurricane and it was decided to move the capital inland to Belmopan. Up until its independence in 1981, Belize was formerly known as British Honduras. Belize City has nonetheless preserved the old world charm of its colonial period, notably in the central district around the Swing Bridge, which spans the river. The population of Belize comprises Creoles, Indians, and people of mixed race, but the most dominant racial group remains the Black West Indians, descendants of the African slaves. As for the Maya Indians, they represent only 10% of the population. Forced inland by the attacks of pirates and corsairs, they took refuge in the forests. Their Yucatan brothers who fled from Mexico at the end of the 19th century after the caste war joined them there. With less than 180,000 inhabitants, Belize is the least populated country in Central America, which doesn't prevent patriotism from expressing itself, if only through song. The time are changing from this time for you and for the people? Um, well, 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 yes, it's some different. It's changed plenty. One, yes, one there, there is a certain more, difference. More experience in everything. Lots of things have changed. In a certain manner, we have more experience in many fields, I think. When you want to buy an accordion like this one for here, for example, you can do it. Before, with my father, my mother, and my brothers, we were too many, it was impossible. My father and mother lived on a farm. We had nothing, no cassettes, nothing. My mother had only one thing in mind, working so that she could feed us all, you know what I mean? My mother always used to say to me, it doesn't matter, smile. So I used to dance with her. When I think back to that time, I prefer the choices I've made and the peaceful life I lead now.
Descending the river Belize, which gave its name to the town, we rejoined the Stella Solaris. As the day draws to an end, a group of passengers gather round a lecturer, attempting unsuccessfully to catch a glimpse of the famous green ray, which appears as the sun sinks below the horizon. A beautiful green. Puerto Cortes is the doorway to Honduras, which covers the southern border of the Maya world. The Stella Solaris slowly pulls into dock. Puerto Cortes is primarily a trading port and doesn't receive many cruise ships. The light rain that heralded our arrival having stopped, we take the route leading inland towards Copan. Situated on the Guatemala border, the Copan site is one of the most important of the Maya world. Before our arrival in Copan, we find out more about tobacco growing, which is the region's main economic activity. It takes 70 days to grow tobacco. First we sow, and after 70 days we can start cutting. After being cut, the tobacco is stored in a large hanger. The tobacco leaves are then detached from their branches and hung up to dry. What 
exactly the difference between this tobacco and the one we saw when we came in. The difference is that this one has just been cut. It's still green. It's not dry enough yet. We've only just hung it up. When it dries, it will be like the other one. And how long has it been hanging up? Mm. About four days. Four days. And the other one? Over a month. When will it be ready to be made into cigars? Which one? The other one? Yes. It's ready now. Yeah. A few meters away on the other side of the road, Maria earns a few lampiras, the Honduran currency, making cigars. Where do you get the tobacco? I buy it here and there from people who work in the fields and who bring me some, when I'm not busy doing anything else like housework or cooking. I make 300 cigars a day. 300 a day? Yes. And how do people know that you sell cigars? Because a lot of people come here. They're always looking for good cigars. So they ask around and that's how they find me. In the distance, nestled in the hollow of those mountains, marking the border with Guatemala, is Copan. Copan, like all the important Maya sites, was a real city and not only a political or religious center. The first recorded date at Copan is the year 435, but it's in the 8th century that the city reached its peak. All the sovereign rulers of Copan took their names from the stars or the animals in the surrounding forests. Amongst them, the king known as 18 Rabbit is undoubtedly the most famous. He's responsible for the completion of the Acropolis and the terraces surrounding the central plaza. More interested, it seems, by art than by war, the King 18 Rabbit was captured by warriors from the rival city of Quirigua and sacrificed on the 3rd of May, 738. The sovereigns who succeeded him, such as Smoke Monkey and Smoke Squirrel, continued his work. But at the beginning of the 9th century, under the reign of Rising Sun, its 16th sovereign, Copan, was abandoned. Insufficient agricultural capacity? Weather conditions? We can only guess at the reasons that led to the rapid decline of Copan as one of the principal Maya sites of the 9th and 10th centuries. What is remarkable at Copan and which sets this Maya site apart from all the others is the quantity and beauty of its sculptures, some of which are combined with the monuments. But the most amazing and most unusual sculptures of Copan grouped together on the central plaza are the stela, built to the glory of the sovereigns. The stela that we have back over here gives you a representation of uh, one of the rulers of Copan ruins, you know, that uh, it's supposed to be the sixth ruler of Copan called uh, Smoke Jaguar. So um, as you can see, it shows you some examples of some of the uh, gears that these people used to wear to play the ball game. You know, chest protector, protection on the, on the knees, uh, and on their way so they could bounce the ball harder from one side to the other. You know? Built to celebrate the ascension to the throne of 18 Rabbit, the Stella represents the earth in the form of a monster out of which the sovereign seems to emerge, dressed in a loincloth and belts. He holds in his hands an instrument symbolizing sacrifice, and his head is surmounted by the effigy of the earth monster. On the side of the stella, glyphs expressing syllables or concepts remind us that the Maya were the only pre-Hispanic people to possess a written language system capable of translating almost any concept, both simple and advanced. Yeah. 
With its lime-washed walls and grid pattern design back streets surrounding the village square, Copan, situated less than a kilometer from the Maya site, has preserved its traditional character. Stella Solaris sails into view of Roatan, situated a few kilometers from the Honduran coast. The island of Roatan, situated outside the Maya population zone, has a unique position in the region. But what attracts the tourists to this exotic island is the hot sun and warm limpid sea. Dorn Ebanks, who is fascinated by the history of this island, gives us his opinion on this. Well, in this season, uh, rain and wind is not normal. We are um, accustomed to have a very tropical climate, which means uh, a high degree of temperature and also sunlight. But due to the fact of the global weather pattern known as El Nino, we have a very high fluctuation in the weather here in Latin America and also in Central America. Yes, the situation is that the Mayan Indian did not settle here on the island. It was the Payan Indian. And there are evidences of their original settlement here on these islands in many hills and mountains and ranges of this archipelago you can find artifacts trinkets and different um, things pottery and residium from tables that they use for ceremonies and during the year 1796 and 1797 there was an up the uprising in St. Vincent the Grenadine in the Antilles and the uprising was a product of the Indian and Caribbean mixture Indian and Afro-Caribbean mixture of was black slaves and some Indians mixed and this group of people were not so motivated or excited about slavery so therefore they made a mutiny and the British government along with the Spanish colonizer shipped them from St. Vincent down to up to this area here in the Caribbean
The Stella Solaris approaches Santo Tomas de Castilla, the last port of call on this cruise of discovery of the Maya world. This small commercial port on the Caribbean coast of Guatemala seems to be leaning against the luxuriant tropical forest, which covers the entire part of the country. We fly over the thick jungle, heading towards the province of Peten, where the most beautiful and mysterious jewel of the Maya Empire is to be found, Tikal. Before going to Tikal, let's stop at Flores. Situated on an island in the Lake Petenitsa, Flores is a small town with brightly colored houses. The market of Flores doesn't possess the rich variety and colorful exuberance of those of Antigua or Chichicastenango. Here the quantities of corn or peppers are carefully measured out. All that is good for cooking, to cook with. Pepper too is good. Pepper too is good for cooking. We use them for cooking beans and lots of other things. On the road leading to Tikal, a group of children are selling small wood-carved animals representing the animals of the Maya jungle. As we drive deeper into the forest, we start dreaming of Tikal at the rise of dawn. summit of the Pyramid of the Lost World, we listen, enraptured, to the sounds of the waking forest, the flight of toucans or parakeets. Here nature seems to have preserved its original magic. We feel in harmony with the Maya priests, the guardians of this sacred place, who, over a thousand years ago, gazed upon this same site. Tikal was occupied by the Maya as early as 900 BC, but reached its peak between 550 and 950 of our present era. 
At that time, 10,000 inhabitants lived on the site of Tikal, which found itself at the center of the Maya realm and partly explains its prodigious development. The Maya Empire flourished between 250 and 900 AD in the tropical forest of Central America. There are approximately 2,000 Maya sites, but the most famous among them is Tikal. Tikal, which numbers around 4,000 buildings, was considered at this time to be the New York of the Maya world. Tikal is composed of a large number of structures and temples, such as the Pyramid of the Lost World or the Pyramid of the Jaguar bearing witness to a period of architectural activity of over 300 years. A friendly and familiar inhabitant of Tikal, a Kowati strolls nonchalantly amongst the ruins. Nos encontramos en la Plaza Mayor. This is Plaza Mayor, which constitutes the center of Tikal. The elite used to come here to attend the ceremonies performed by the high priests. Can you visualize one of these priests approaching the temple with his feather headdress, his accessories, necklaces, bracelets, his belt and the cape made from a jaguar pelt? When he climbed the steps, he looked like a snake. And when he reached the summit of the temple, the entire community could admire him in all his splendor. Amongst the elements making up the pyramid, like this one here for example, there is, first of all, a stella which represents the supreme ruler. Next, there are three platforms representing harmony and stability. Then the fourth level, representing the four cardinal points. Then the level above, with the corners, that makes five. The five extremes, the five senses. And the two top levels, that makes seven. Seven representing the rainbow, the alliance between God and his human creatures. The site, which covers over 120 square kilometers, comprises 4,000 known buildings and four main pathways providing access to the various temples during the ceremonies. Tikal is today the reserved domain of the howler monkey, who swings from tree to tree, feeding on the fruit of the sapodila tree, a tree from which the Maya extracted the chicle juice, which is used today to make chewing gum. At the time of the abandon of Tikal by the Maya, the large platform of the North Acropolis supported eight funerary temples. This lost world has retained its strange power. These remains reflect the beauty and harmony of a civilization that produced kings with names such as Great Jaguar Paw, Turned Up Nose, or Cloudy Sky. The Maya were polydeist. They believed in many gods, as well as in one supreme god. The cardinal points reflect the creation of the world. The east represents the birth of the sovereign planet. The west marks the evening. The east is red, the west is black. The south is represented by the color yellow, and the north by the color white. The center of the earth is green. Radiating out from its capital, the Maya civilization flourished and dominated this part of Central America for several centuries before finally disappearing, swallowed up by the tropical rainforests. 
Even the conquistador Hernán Cortés didn't manage to discover Tikal. Protected today at the center of a national park reserve, this site remains the symbol of the mystery and magnificence of the Maya. Magnificent, powerful, and mysterious cities of Tulum, Chichen Itza, Copan, and Tikal represented the splendor of the Maya world. Yes, please. Uh, can I help you? Zingo. Just call me. Okay. Nice. But if you have the telephone, just pick up. Okay. During the two days at sea since leaving Galveston, the passengers have had time to familiarize themselves with their boat. As the Mexican coast comes into sight, some of them are eager to obtain last-minute information. Others more studious carefully read through the information brochures provided by the onboard lecturers. The Stella Solaris sails within view of Cozumel Island. Uva was cruising off the coast of Tulum. Impressed by the magnificent temples covered with fresco paintings and guarded by feather arrayed warriors, he likened Tulum to Seville. The harshness and long duration of the crossing would explain such exaggerated enthusiasm because Tulum is in fact a modest city with small sized buildings. In order to disguise the mediocre quality of the structures, the temple walls were decorated with large fresco paintings with cosmic motives or with stucco sculptures representing the divine god who descends from heaven to receive the offerings of the humans and who symbolizes, for certain people, the extraterrestrial origin of the Maya. The main monument we have here is the temple of frescos. On that temple, we have at the corners the representation of the life and death, or the duality, be alive or be dead. The one on the south side is light and the eyes are open. The one on the north side is dark with closed eyes. A rudimentary hut with a roof made of palm trees, built on a cultivated patch of forest, this is the traditional dwelling of the Yucatan lowland population. The descendants of the Maya number approximately six million. Occupied by the Maya for 2,000 years, Cozumel was then almost completely abandoned. It wasn't until the Second World War, when Captain Cousteau explored the Palancar Reef, that the island was rediscovered and revealed to the world. Since then, Cozumel has become one of Mexico's most popular tourist resorts and one of the most favored stopover points for cruise ships coming from Florida. Big ship. Yeah, very big. Big ship. I've heard of this 
We normally receive about 20 boats a week. The tourists who come here are mainly Italian, French, German and Americans. Lots of Americans. Really? Lots of Americans? Yes, they come from Miami, Florida. It takes an hour to sail from Playa del Carmen to Cozumel with this boat. Despite the beauty of the sea, which becomes an almost transparent turquoise color close to the shore, it must be remembered that the weather in this part of the Caribbean is very unpredictable, and the sea can be dangerous. It's thus that one of the creators of the world in Maya mythology was named Huracan, the origin of our present-day word hurricane. Galveston, Texas. It's here in this town on the edge of the Gulf of Mexico that the Stella Solaris, the solar star, waits to sail. An appropriate name for a cruise marked in a sense by the stars. While less than 70 kilometers away at Houston is the NASA Space Center, a veritable headquarters since Apollo 13 of the American Space Conquest. The passengers of the Stella Solaris are embarking on a voyage which will lead them day after day to the discovery of a civilization in which astronomy played an essential role. The Stella Solaris slowly leaves Galveston and commences its long two-day crossing of the Gulf of Mexico towards the Mexican peninsula of Yucatan. Covering an area of over 1,000 kilometers long and 600 kilometers wide, the former Maya world takes in present-day southern Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, and part of Honduras and El Salvador. Since the dawn of our era, right up until the 15th century. We arrive at Playa del Carmen, a small market town and tourist resort, famous for its beaches, and which is the departure point for the Maya site of Tulum. We are in Tulum, and this city is located in front of the Caribbean Sea. The Mayans make this city with the protection of the wall and the protection of the reef on this side. The name of the reef is Palancar. It's the longest reef in America. Comes from San Pedro Sula in Central America and goes to Isla Mujeres in front of Cancun. Founded in the year 1200, Tulum reached its peak two centuries later, around 1400. At that time, it was a trading port on the main sea route on the east coast of Yucatan. Overlooking the Caribbean Sea, certain buildings like El Castillo served as lookout posts or landmarks for sailors. In 1518, the conquistador Juan de Grijalva